Greetings and welcome to Behind the Curtain. Here on Behind the Curtain, we're going to look at the world of community theater. I'm your host, Susan Harrington, and today we are being joined by J.C. Lynn Rutledge. J.C. is a local actor, a director, and all around <laughs> bon vivant and extraordinaire. So welcome. Thanks for having Thank me. You. Thank you for coming here. Uh, you're known for your comedic action. I'm going to dive right in. Do you approach performing comedic roles differently than you do dramatic roles? Um, I don't know that I, I approach comedic roles differently than dramatic roles, but the material is different. Uh, there's that old saying that uh, acting for comedy is more difficult than acting for drama. Though you'd never know from the way you know professional award shows yeah. go, but um, and I think that is only slightly true because with comedy you're looking for a very specific reaction. You're looking for laughter, and for someone to truly laugh at something, part of it has to be unexpected. Uh, not necessarily the payoff or the joke, mm -hmm. but something about the way you get there, or the payoff or the, or the joke has to be unexpected. Um, with drama, which to me the best dramas have some layer of comedy to them, um, otherwise I don't necessarily care about the people <laughs> that much or it's just a real downer. Um, with drama, you, it's a little bit more of a normal organic way of getting there. And with a lot of comedy, it's still that organic way of getting there, but you are looking for that specific rhythm. Yeah. You are looking for a specific reaction from the audience. I was at Nationals and someone had on a, the back of their t-shirt, fluff is tough. <laughs> yeah, you, you, it's, it's, it's a timing thing because you're kind of waiting for it to hit the brain pan and then, oh, that's what they're laughing at. Yeah, yeah I, I, well, and I think it is also one of those things that you'll, I think one thing that I bring to the table is just approaching comedy in a little bit of a different way um, because I think there are lots of scripts that we know um, tried and true ones that are always going to get laughs, but most actors will go to about getting the laugh the same way because it's it's familiar and yeah. it, it's how our brains work. It's how, uh, particularly when we're talking specifically about like American theater or uh, Western theater, okay, uh, just because we have a similar comedic language. If we're talking about not. Uh, physical comedy, which is universal to me. Uh, I, you know, I have a background in improv, <coughs> excuse me, um, and we had, uh, when I was at Improv Boston, we had a troupe from Mexico come up called Impro Top. And they did, uh, they did a bunch of different shows at the theater, some with language and some without. And they did ones with language, but they were being so true to kind of a clowning style of comedy it fully improvised, yeah. oh, okay. but it transcended language. I knew what was going on yeah. because of uh, the emotion and the acting they were bringing to it, you know, the, all the emotion they were bringing to it, but also because some comedy is just universal and physical comedy is so universal. Yeah. So, um, but uh, yeah, approaching, approaching them, I don't necessarily approach them differently, but knowing that you want laughs yeah. is a very specific thing rather than wanting to touch someone through the truth, the sadness, the, the uh, heartbreak of a character. It's a, it's a little different because yeah. those things are less universal all around and we've all experienced those things differently. Laughter we tend to experience in a similar nature. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, okay. So in the early 2000s you stepped away from the scripted theater and you focused on improv improvisational theater. So how and or why did that come about? Um, so I've been doing theater since I was about six. I have an older sister and older brother who did um, high school and community theater when I was younger and I kind of just kind of fell into it and it's fun. Um, and I was doing a production um, with a uh, group that no longer exists now, Atlantis Playmakers. I was doing I Hate Hamlet. Hilarious script. Such a great script really beautiful moments to it w within the script. But we were in the second night of production and uh, I was playing the real estate agent. It's like a six or seven person show. And it's the first scene 
all the exposition about why this actor is here from L.A., the soap opera actor, and now he's going to be doing Hamlet in New York in the park, right? And the actor looks at me. We're like maybe five lines into the scene. The lead looks at me, and I can see it's gone. And he has, he is, there is nothing there. And I had this lovely, <laughs> luckily, I should say, a piece of blocking where I had to take a box of stuff because we're moving him into this new apartment upstage and away from the audience and put it down. And um, uh, Chris Cardoni was playing uh, the ghost of John Barrymore. Oh, and God. he was in waiting for his a spotlight to hit him. At the end of the scene, he's up in this uh, window that was actually part of the building. And I happened to look up at him, and he just did this. <laughs> and I was like, okay, it's, it's on me, and my brain thankfully worked quickly, and I said, okay, this is all exposition, what needs to come out? And I was able to get the actor, I, I will take credit for this, I was able to feed him, get him, he jumped, and then I got him to come back, and we got all the information that needed to be on the table on the table. And um, a mutual friend of ours, David Fisher, I had been seeing him do shows in Improv Boston for a long time, and that moment I went, I'm going to start taking classes there simply because I think having experience with doing improv would assist me if I ever have to cover anyone. Yeah. And it is, it has. <clears throat> but that's why I started doing it, and I just kind of fell in love with it, because it, um, improv, when done right, when it's done the best, it is about really truly connecting with your scene partner, working, um, playing the, the reality and the stakes of that relationship, even if it's something super superficial, and creating something together, which is the thing that I love about theater, is that kind of collaborative, communi uh, community-based creation. Uh, and that, I think, is also why I fell in love with improv so much. And so then I was away from scripted theater for a while, still doing, like, directing some one acts and being in some one acts here oh, and there. Okay. But that was primarily it. I ended up doing some sketch, which is scripted, um, and doing a couple musicals that they do at Improv Boston that were all original. Well, Improv Boston doesn't exist anymore, sadly, either. Is it, but the, is it that they don't exist anymore, <coughs> or they don't have a home because no, of... No, they fully oh. Oh, closed okay. everything down. Um, Oh, were, they, were, they in, were they in Kenny? Yes. They oh, were, Prospect? They were originally in Prospect okay. um, around, oh my goodness, I'm not going to get the year right, 2007, 2008, did a huge um, capital campaign, donations, the, all the performers there who were all volunteer at the time did, put in so much time and effort, and we actually got a space that was in Central Square on Prospect. Okay. So okay. it went from... Um, uh, next to Christina's in Inman Square, which oh, is okay. a small space to a larger space. Oh, okay. And they had that for a good number of years until COVID hit. So it's where Man Ray is now again. Oh. <laughs> that was the space they were in. Then they were doing, um, they were using the, uh, what's it called, the Rockwell in uh, Davis Square for a time. But unfortunately, they just got hit really bad post-COVID. And, and um, the other groups have, have uh come up from that. Yeah, because of the one in Roslindale. Yep, the Rosy Theater. Um, there's also one in Union Square, too. Uh, and usually, Rosy is an exception, but usually it's groups that are renting or using other space. Yeah, because we used to have our Toastmasters meeting there. Yeah. So, Toastmasters. Yeah. <laughs> and um, we had to, they had to dis displace us because I guess they're doing a lot more more things. So, so okay, so how did your... Well, I think you kind of already told me how your improv background uh, approach or performance as an actor, as in, the, okay, wait a minute. How it affected me. Yeah, as yeah. I, I would say um, when I started coming back to um, doing scripted theater, uh, the funny thing is the first thing I did was actually ne next fall was the first um, full length production I did when I kind of came back okay. into auditioning. Um, and that, though I had some funny bits in that, I mean, that was, that was a drama. It was a very emotional drama. It was a very um, beautiful piece of theater. I loved working with it, uh, working on that and working with that cast. Um, but when I started doing comedy again, I find that I have this kind of now subconscious thing where um, 
I'm kind of actively listening, not just to my scene partners, but I can subconsciously, I can feel and hear what the oh, okay. audience is responding to. So in some ways you can lean into certain things. Um, now when you're doing more naturalistic pieces, you do a little less of that because it's a little more grounded in reality. Uh, but say, um, I was talking about Moon of Buffalo. Playing Roz, I had that monologue at the top of the second act maybe, or the third act, where she's on, sta on the stage within the, the play within the play, doing private lives, and she has the opening monologue and the actor doesn't come on because he is backstage drunk. <laughs> and so she has to, her character is improvising. Yeah. So even though I was, I had dialogue that I was saying, I could feel what the audience was responding to. Yeah. So every time I did that, it was slightly different. The, the cadence, what I was punctuating, what I was leaning into comedy wise, how long the pauses were. Because <clears throat> I was also never gonna trip up another actor by doing that. Yeah. Um, but I do think that comes from doing improv, and I know improv scares a lot of people, a lot of actors who do um, scripted theater, but I do think every actor I've ever worked with could benefit, yeah. every director I've ever worked with could benefit from just taking some improv classes. Because uh, people, I have, my improv one class, had we had lawyers, we had salespeople, we had a CEO of a company, and it was just people who were knew that they needed a little more experience in actively being in the moment yeah. or public speaking or yeah. things like that. So I, I do think kind of having your, your, as you would say to like a kindergartner, your listening ears yes. on all the time has been beneficial in life in general, but specifically for theater, I think that's been a huge thing. And it's also freed me up to, uh, in regards to comedy, to just trying new things, whether it's in an audition or in a show because I'll, I, you have to have an inherent trust in your uh, scene partner okay. in improv. Okay, yeah, okay. And I think sometimes with, with when we're doing scripted theater, maybe we don't have that as much when it's comedy and you really need to have that. Okay, well I'm gonna, I'm gonna be a nosy Parker and go yes. back in time to when you were a newlywed. Oh, yes. And did, <coughs> Complete works of Shakespeare with your new spouse and who was the other person? I forget. Uh, it was Mark Astano. Okay, I don't know him well, but anyway, that was amazing. The three oh, of you flipping you. and flopping around that stage, and I would say timing. I'd say a lot of that, a lot of the credit for that goes to Laura Lippitt, who Laura S. B. Then, who directed the show. Oh, okay. Um, because there were certain things in that that just there were there's moments in that where you do have to do improv with the audience, right? There's interaction. We pull audience members up on the stage, yeah. uh, talking about people from scripted theater being afraid of improv. So many people didn't audition for that show. So many people will not audition for a show if you mention improv in the audition. Yeah. They freak out for some reason. And the same as if you mention Shakespeare in an audition. Lots of actors who do scripted so theater. So the numbers drop. Peace out. <laughs> um, and it's so sad because that show in particular, um, yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's so fun. It's so much fun to do. But Lara, um, she hasn't directed in a quite quite some time. She had a kid and focused on family, but she just talked about precision. Uh, our first rehearsal, she did the Romeo and Juliet section, which is the um, uh, the two houses, both alike in enmity. No, that's not the word. Oh God! Um, but that, and she had choreographed movements for the two. And I wasn't. I didn't do that. I, w I wasn't in the that section. But the two guys learning that, this very quick paced, almost ri like rigid to begin with, movement, choreography, uh, rhythm. And I think there was something about having some moments that were like that and then some r moments that were just wild every night just made that particular production of that show work really well. Wow. <clears throat> and like you said, Jason and I, we auditioned before we got married went off and eloped, and then came back married. And Laura knew we were getting married because she was getting married soon after us. <laughs> and uh, we had had some, you know, new, like pre uh, bride-to-be conversations. Um, but yeah, so 
and the fact that you go by your regular name yeah. and our name because I, I took Jason's last name are so similar. Yeah. Um, it added a, another layer of ridiculousness to the entire thing. That thing was, I mean, and especially at Hubby, because it's such an intimate space, and you guys are all over the place. And like you said, you're pulling people out of the audience. That was, that was amazing. So I just, I had to say something about that because I do so enjoy seeing him on stage as well. <laughs> anyway, so does the style or genre of th theatrical comedy impact your approach to the role? So how does you know how do you approach let's say slapstick stick versus uh, wordplay? Um, I th I think the role or the show in and of itself, the style of the show overall, definitely does um, impact the way I approach it. I'll for use two examples that are you would think super closely related, but my roles weren't. Uh, I this year with Clown of Howard Players did. The Comedy of Errors, and I played Romeo Syracuse, who is one of the two servants. And um, the, the, that director did a beautiful job of uh, setting something that could be kind of, not kind of, completely upsetting because there are Shakespearean beatings that are supposed to be comedic uh, of servants in the show. And she set the entire thing in 1920s comedy. So um, I. The, the other Dromeo and I, it's two sets of twins, and they get confused for each other. We were dressed like Charlie Chaplin. <coughs> um, so that was lovely. Getting that mustache right so it didn't look wrong uh, was, was, was a bit of a trial for the makeup artist. Um, but so, so that was broad, slapstick, falling all over the place. Uh, I'm, I'm very good, even at my age and in the shape I'm in, I'm very good at being able to control my body in space and, and throwing my body about. <laughs> Um, a lot of his of history of doing, of playing Shakespearean clowns, and that's a skill I, skill set I have that helps with things like this. But um, with that, you know you can go broader, right? You know, uh, also allowed to talk to the audience because there's lots of addressing directly to the audience. Mm -hmm. Those moments like those. Um, but then, and again, playing a male character, um, not to lean into you know gender binary, but. To, to go into like traditional male role um, and, and doing that kind of real physical comedy, you just can go so over the top in a very specific way. Now, um, when we did, uh, when I did Incorruptible, which is more of a farce at Burlington Players. Um, oh, I didn't know they did that. That, uh, Jason and I. Oh, okay. yeah. Um, that was maybe not world wordplay, but it was situational comedy. And though it was physical, it wasn't slapstick. Yeah. Um, I, some people maybe could call it because it was physical comedy, but it was farcical physical comedy. And that is different than full on slapstick. And I was playing, you know, the female love interest. I had to pretend to be a dead body for a large part of the time. <laughs> I was in a burlap sack and got thrown around. So. Uh, the approach to that was different because I, I would never have gone as broad with Maria, Marie, as I did with Dromeo, because uh, it wouldn't have served the character or the script in the same way. Okay. And then uh, d having just done Mary Wives of Windsor and playing Mistress Page, what a delightful, just a delightfully fun role because she's so in control the almost the entire show. And that was a nice mixture of being able to uh, do very broad acting um, because she gets to act, be, the character gets to act bad. Oh, okay. So be a bad actor. Yeah. But then also gets to be very clever clever when she's not doing that and she's just, I'm just playing Mistress Page, all, all the verbal stuff. So a, a little different. So with, with your directing, because <coughs> I don't want to lose this, you mostly have done one acts or full lengths? I've mostly done one acts. I did my first, I was lucky to do my um, first full length. It's something that I've, people have been kind of nudging me towards for a long time. And uh, being a perfectionist, it's hard to make yourself do that and not be afraid of failure. Uh, but I did my first uh, full length. We were lucky, we were one of the last shows to get a full run before COVID in 2019 at Acme Theater. Um, I did this beautiful uh, script by Julia Cho called. Um, the language archive, and um, it it was 
it was so rewarding. It felt right. Yeah. It felt like something I should be doing. So I, I'm getting that prodding again. I have been the last couple of years to submit stuff to direct in, in some places. I haven't yet found the script that matches the space. Um, and that, that space, I mean, <coughs> I know they've recently lost it, and that's kind of sad because the things that they did in that space, you'd say, oh, that's not going to happen down here. And they made it happen. It was just a wonderful. I also designed the set for that show. Oh, wow. And we, it had a bunch of different locations, and a director that had directed there a lot, um, Nancy Curtin Willis, said to me at intermission when she came to see the show, how did you do that? Yeah. <laughs> so it, it was a set with lots of moving parts. Wow. Um, I had a lot of help fr from, uh, from my husband, Jason. Yeah. Um, we had a great crew who came in to work on the set, and David Shepard helped a yeah. lot, um, and Tom Barry, just knowing the space much better than I did. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, it was just a very rewarding experience, and it was really collaborative, and I brought my entire design team in, um, which isn't, you know, ha having been on play reading committees isn't a thing that every director can do or wants to do. Because, um, you know, knowing a space, particularly for like lighting, uh, I was lucky Matt Silverstein came in and did my lighting for that and he had lit there before. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, I had a friend who composed some original music for that. Nicole Sparks did the sound, oh, uh, the sound design for it. And, you know, I was very, I was very, I don't want to say hands on because it makes it sound very controlling, but I wanted specific things. Yeah. Uh, uh, Eileen from Vokes came in and did the, the costumes for me, uh, for me uh, Eileen Bovier. Um, oh, I don't know her. Um, she does a lot of stuff at Vogue, so oh, uh, with okay. Elizabeth Tustian. Um, now that name I know. So uh, I also had the most beautiful cast, and um, I, I had a couple of, uh, Eileen said it was like one of the best collaborations. She oh, felt nice. like she did, and it was very, that was an interesting thing. It's one thing to like tell an actor, I don't know, it's different to tell an actor that you need them to go in a different direction. With designers, I, I cannot sew a button <laughs> to stay on is not a thing. I could, I could costume it by being like, yeah. I could pull pieces and yeah. costume a, a thing, but I can't. I couldn't costume a show if I had to build stuff. And Eileen can do both. And um, But having to be like, she, she brought something in, and I was like, I am not feeling this. I looked at the actor, I was like, the actor is not feeling this. And I was like, how do I go about explaining it? And I kind of danced around it for a while, and then I was just like, I don't think this is working. And she's like, okay. Wow. So she said, yeah, you don't have to feel bad. I'm here to serve yeah, the, the script the, and the production yeah. as well. And it's about not just my vision, but every, you know the overall vision. And sometimes you don't know until you see <clears throat> something. Exactly or see it in comparison to, to, to something else. I, that goes so for directing actors, too, yeah. though. Because um, sometimes you give someone a direction, and it's not working. Yeah. And it, it's not necessarily that they're not giving you what you asked for, or that it could be that you didn't communicate it the way you needed to. But it could be that they give you exactly what you asked for, and you're realizing this is not what the script calls for. Yeah. This is not serving the text. This is not serving the, the characters that they've built. And um, I, I definitely have one of my actors who just felt bad and kept beating themselves up about it. And I was like, this isn't on you, this is on me. This is on me for, we tr not even on anyone, we tried something that didn't yeah. work. It's not you failing, yeah. it's not you um, not giving me what I need, it's us trying to serve the text in the script. So, okay, so you, that was your, your, your full length. You said you mostly have done one acts. Is it one acts that have been written writ, written by local people? Because like I know QP does some things like that, or is it uh, published pu published one acts? Um, I've done some stuff like this with Atlantis Playmakers. I've done a couple things like that at um, uh, at Improv Boston, but um, Acme's New Works Winter oh. Festival. Um, I participated in that for a really long time, okay. and that's kind of it's been a mix of people. Uh, my favorite one, hands down, that I ever worked on was, um, was that the second one I directed uh, was Mark, Mark Harvey Levine, I think is the, the playwright's name. Um, and he, it was called LA 8 AM. And it was about a couple, the scene is very simple. It's a couple clearly struggling with just 
being a couple in the morning. They live in LA, it's 8 a.m. And um, something happens where cereal gets spilled everywhere all over the floor. But there are these two omniscient characters who step out and are narrating it. Uh -huh. And um, we, the, the four people that were in my cast were just quite lovely to work with. Do you prefer working with smaller cast or larger cast? I think right now for me, small-ish, smaller casts mm -hmm. are what I feel capable with. Um, I did have a theater approach me about directing something that was larger that had, uh, I think it was like 10 to 12 people, where most of the actors would be playing multiple characters. Oh, okay. Now, I do think I could be capable of that. I yeah. think the, the script, that it's a great script, and, <coughs> uh, excuse me, um, I think my skill set speaks to that script, but currently I don't, I don't feel confident enough mm -hmm. that it wouldn't have driven me crazy. Mm. I have a very, right now, I'm just very, um, maybe because of my neurodivergency, but <laughs> I just get very focused mm -hmm. on the piece. Like with Language Archive, I was, that was my life for, from when I got it to when it went up and it, to when they opened. Um, and I think with a piece that large, which is also a period piece, so there's costuming involved. Yeah. Multiple, they're playing multiple characters, so there's, you have to decide how are you handling that with costuming. Um, I definitely would have done, you know, full on open gender casting with that entire script. I just know that I, I didn't personally feel confident, not in my skills, but in being in the right place uh, emotionally and mentally to really dig into that and handle it. And it would have been a shorter, we would be rehearsing it right now. And I think that wouldn't, I didn't have enough lead time to really get in there and like dig into the script and really plan out how I would want to the, approach it. The other thing too is the more people you have, the more scheduling oh. issues you can run into. <coughs> and yeah. and plus, and beside which is, I, I primarily serve as a production manager, so I am cheap as can be. So four people keeps it down, keeps it quiet. Well, I am all Not about, quiet, but keeps it. Yes, I am. I mean, there's a reason that I've done props for a good number of shows. I'm good at borrowing. I'm good at begging for things. I'm good at making things from literal garbage. Yeah. I, I take pride in that as, as a, like a, a 3D artist. But dealing with all of that yeah. as a director and the scheduling, I mean, the, the administrative side yeah. of it. Um, which I still like to be involved in to a certain degree. Um, and you really need, you need a stage manager that you gel with. Yeah. And uh, I, I have one, Nicole O'Keefe, godsend, amazing. Um, she's, she's, I, she, she's stage managed, complete works. Oh, okay. And that show is a beast. Yeah. And we had, we had Shannon, uh, Gimmerick and Nicole Sparks backstage either side for all of those quick changes yeah. for all of uh, We could run off and just put a hand out and grab a prop so Having the right backstage people. Okay so important. One last question. What is on your bucket list as either an actor or a director? Um, for an actor it changes and recently I've just kind of it's funny because they're roles that normally I would be trying to get people to do the show so Jason, so my husband could audition. And I'm like, no, you do um, One Man, Two Governors, and I'll audition for <laughs> Francis. Because uh -huh. I, I can play a man doing that comedy. The audience will buy into that. Yeah. Um, that's, that's up there, 39 Steps, I would love to play a clown. Um, I love that show, I saw it off Broadway. And uh, all I remember is looking, I went by myself and looking to the people on either side of me like, are you seeing this? Are you seeing how amazing this is? Um, those, are, those two are high up there. Um, I would love to play, I mean, yeah, I probably aged out of it, but um, Mercutio in Romeo and Juliet. Oh, okay. Queen Map Speech, I love it. Um, uh, Grumio in Taming of the Shrew, that, though that script is so highly problematic. And I've never done any um, Shakespearean drama. I've never even auditioned for a Shakespearean drama, and I've done a decent amount of Shakespearean comedies. So that's kind of like across the board. All right. I'd love to play Horatio Hamlet. Directing, there's a show called Small Mouth Sounds 
that is, um, there's almost no dialogue in it except for an offstage voice. Uh, I think I'm a, I think I'm a director who can handle that and who could bring. I actually have a history of doing some silent improv, which in America is unheard of. Uh, but that that's a show I would love to direct. Mm. And I've got I, Tempest. I'd love to direct that. So yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for joining us here on Behind the Curtain. I'm Susan Harrington, and our guest was J.C. Lynn Rutledge. Thank, thank you again. Thank you. I tell your hubby I said hi. I, I miss know. him. <laughs> thank you. ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help.